Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation. Hello and welcome to this episode of Read Smart, the official podcast of the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction. My name is Toby Mundy and I'm the director of the prize. And I'm delighted to be in conversation with authors who are shortlisted for the 2022 award. Our guest today is Polly Moreland, author of A Fortunate Woman, A Country Doctor's Story. Before I speak to Polly, I must, as always, thank our sponsors, the Blavatnik Family Foundation, for their very generous support of this podcast. Welcome, Polly, and congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. It's, um, it's great to be here, Toby. Well, it's great to have you here. And it, it's, a, it's a wonderful, a wonderful book. Um, there's a lot to talk about. Um, <laughs> perhaps we can, if you don't mind, sort of slightly begin at the beginning, which is that your your mother's illness, her Alzheimer's, is the catalyst for this story. Is that f- fair to say? Yeah, I mean, ve- very much so. I mean, in, I'd, my, uh, my lovely mum had been um, grown progressively iller and iller, and this is where in the sort of early, early part of the pandemic, the, the, the late spring in the early pandemic, um, in 2020 and I was clearing my mum's house because she'd she'd moved to a, a residential care home had really become very unwell indeed uh, and I'm, she was massive massive bookworm my mum <laughs> so her house was packed to the rafters with with books and I'd been I'd spent all day clearing bookshelves and then uh, I'd spotted a paperback that had fallen down the back of uh, back of one of her bookcases um and I'd sort of fished it out and it was this, you know, dusty old penguin paperback. And I sort of just blown the dust off it and, I, I, and I'd seen that it was this book, John Berger's A Fortunate Man. Now, I'd read lots of Berger, but I'd not read, come on, I've not come across this book even. So I sort of opened it and, and, you know, it says the story of a country doctor on, on the cover. And I'd opened it and there's this black and white photograph of a landscape, you know, a great rise of dark woodland and a, and a river and a very sort of thick meadow in the foreground. Mm-hmm. And I'm, uh, I, it's, a, it's a sort of thunderbolt moment because I'm thinking, that's the valley where I live. So this is quite some miles away from, you know, 150 miles away from my own mum's home when I was clearing her house. And so I'd realised that this documentary study that... John Berger had undertaken in the in the mid 60s 1966 he observed this country doctor at work but that was set in the in the very landscape I I live in and have lived in for the last decade and also I, I, I'm thinking oh, look, hang on I know the doctor who serves that that community today so from that moment it was all sort of the, at one level the book sort of coalesced in a in a split second, I thought how extraordinary it would be to revisit that story because we were in that, you know, we were in those early days of the pandemic. There was such, such, such a focus on medicine, such fear and consternation around our health, you know, throughout the, throughout the, um, the population, but also this sense that, that the way in which medicine was being practised because of the nature of social distancing and so on was was really in a period of extraordinary flux. So sort of in a, in a snapshot, really, this this story found me. And um, and then it rolls from, I mean, there's lots of stuff I didn't know at that point, so I, I didn't know whether the Doctor even knew about the John Berger book, today's mm. contemporary Doctor. Um, you know, I didn't know at that point the extraordinary um, influence that book had had on her own career pathway. So, um, and I didn't really, at the, even at that stage, understand how many of my, the people who live in my community, my my neighbours, were once um, were once patients of the Doctors in, in John Berger's book. So, in a sense, it started with that story and f- from there it grew and grew and grew. And um, would it be also fair to say that your mother's illness was a catalyst in, an, in another sense as well, which is that I think you, you say at one point that her, her, um, the, her succumbing to dementia had been a period that was frightening and quite chaotic, yeah. but that her care, despite the professionalism and well-meaning professionalism of, of, her, of her carers, had been sort of somewhat rather in, impersonal, is that the, Tremendously that... impersonal. So I, I, that I don't have a, a specific grievance with specific medics, um, but she was 
you know, she never saw the same doctor twice during those last years of her life. And so the the relationship with general practitioners that she'd had, you know, earlier in her life, because she was in her 80s, um, you know, that had entirely broken down. She was in a large practice, multiple doctors, never seemed to see the same person twice, no one who knew her. And that, I mean, it's a particularly, I feel very strongly about this, this is, it's, you know, it's a particular feature of of the way in which um, Alzheimer's unfolds that um, mm. the kind of a trusting relationship with the doctor, uh, someone who knows you before your cognition is challenged in this way, makes, you know, makes a fantastic, you know, makes, it plays a very significant role in the standard of the care that you get. And and hers was very chaotic. Yeah, absolutely. So the book was about. I mean, so so this book, in a sense, was it in a sense a sort of an investigation into what a more personalised form of medicine could be like. I mean, both in Berger's book and then in your response to Berger's book. Yes, and 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 is it possible in the modern world? Because there's this conception and. You know, Burgess' book is still loved by doctors. I'm, I, you know, it's, I, it's probably quite niche to a broader readership, but it's still absolutely adored within the medical profession. But is to a large extent a kind of museum piece in a sense. Certainly, yeah. that model of general practice from the mid '60s it is long is long gone. So, as much as anything, it was trying to look at that that question. Those some of those questions about the doctor-patient relationship and its role in the process of caring for people that was also, you know, blisteringly modern and contemporary. You know, is it still, does it still have a value? And 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 I, I began the process with no answer, no sense of, of what the answer would be. Um, you said just before we came on air that this started as a small story and then has sort of grown. What, does, what did you mean by that? Yeah, so... Because it's so, it was so personal to me. On the one hand, it's so personal to me. So in a sense, it was fired by um, where I was in my family situation. It was fired by something um, very, very personal to me. It's set in this small rural community where I live, which is right out on the fringes, uh, you know, a thickly wooded valley with a river that flows through the middle of it. Uh, you know, at one level, a tremendously sort of bucolic setting, far away from the kind of cut and thrust of NHS policy, in some sense. Um, so it, I think that's the sense in which it, it it started as something very, very small. But then I realised behind the, you know, as I then went on to undertake what was a very in-depth documentary study at one level of a particular doctor working in a particular community, a particular landscape, and it's a it's a love letter to her work and a love letter to the landscape and a love letter to the community, but that also there was this much bigger story going on that was about what it means to be a doctor today and what the meaning of medical vocation is in the 21st century, what, you know, what how the process of care and that medical vocation and, and how 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 fundamental the doctor-patient relationship continues to be to both of those. Can we talk a bit about the um, the role of photography and what yeah. made you decide, as Berger had done, to include photographs? I mean, Richard Baker's got a combination, I think, of landscapes and portraits, yeah. rather unusual portraits in the book. Yeah. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that decision and how you worked with Richard. Yeah, so, um, I mean, the photographs are incredibly important to the storytelling. So um, the photographs are not there simply as illustrations in the kind of, you know, these are not sort of colour plates or black and white plates in the middle of the book. They're entirely stitched into the storytelling. And I was very struck. And so um, John Berger worked with a Swiss photographer called Jean Moore, um, whom he worked with on, uh, on a, many occasions throughout his throughout his working life. And, and Jean Moore's photographs are woven into the storytelling of a fortunate man. Um, and they function as a they function as a kind of parallel story 
that works alongside, so that word and image, there is a sort of music between word and image. Now, this was really, this hugely spoke to me because I come from a, you know, I come from a, do- a, a, a filmic background. And so the role that, that images can play within, a, within storytelling is something very dear to my heart. So actually, there's something very interesting Berger had, has said about the, about the way in which photographs can work with text. He talks about them as, as being like um, uh, quotations within a text. Um, and that's something I've experienced over many years as a, as a documentary maker. So um, that was what we were reaching for. John, uh, Richard Baker and I, was that sense of an interplay between word and image. Um, and then in practical terms, how we worked, well, the book was written through the pandemic. So, um, you know, there's all sorts of constraints on how we could work. But I suppose Richard came down to the valley on probably 14 or 15 days in the course of the many months I was spending with the doctor. Um and because it's my home community and and I live here, I spent quite a lot of time walking around the landscape with him or saying, oh, if you, you know, go to that ridge <laughs> on the far side behind those conifers, mm. there's an extraordinary view there. So we, um, uh, 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 the landscape photographs worked in that way. In terms of the, there are also, uh, there's also quite a significant body of photographs taken um observe you know that are documentary photo photographs in, mm. that observe the doctor at work so um he went and spent i think five or six days in the surgery with her i mean it's important to say that none of the photographs relate to the specific stories that are told within within the narrative but they provide a kind of counterpoint they provide a a music if you like a a, a sense of breathing space or emotional pauses or way moments you know moments of reflection within the text and light and shade in a way that I felt really um really uh, fed into the way in which I wanted to tell the story that was underpinned by this emotional narrative as well as as simply a, a a non-fiction narrative in the conventional sense. Yeah, and just out of curiosity, I mean, how did you had did Richard had Richard read the manuscript and then went off to take pictures, or did you brief him, or did was it, did you did you agree together that it would be good to have pictures of this? I had how did just how did you work together? Yeah. Right? So <laughs> yeah, so Richard took about four and a half thousand photographs, <laughs> so he yeah. took a lot of photographs. Um, uh, and we worked in tandem. So, n- no, all the photography was undertaken um, before the book was written. So it was just so we had a period, if you like, of observation that was just observation. I was doing lots of talking with them, um, talking and spending time with the doctor. Um, and I mean, I suppose this working method comes out of my my the way I used to work in film. Um so we had a period of observation and then Richard's photography was undertaken during that period on a few on a few days when 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 he um, when he joined us here. Um, and then I went away and I wrote. So I di- I disappeared, uh, <laughs> disappeared from everyone's lives for for a, a, a number, quite a number of months and and wrote the first draft of the manuscript. And then Richard and I came back together um when the when the manuscript was finished and i so i had written a manuscript in which i'd 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 i knew where i wanted the photographs to land mm. but i didn't yet exactly know what those photographs were in some cases i i had an idea in others i was just like oh you, that we needed something within the storytelling here so at that point richard and i came back together with this vast body of photographs mm-hmm. and over it we had an incredibly sort of intense couple of days where we would sort of try different photographs <laughs> in different spots and saw you know and, it, and it's what's fascinating is you would you know they do something to the storytelling so occasionally we I you know I might have had an idea I wanted a particular sort of you know particular land kind of landscape in a particular spot and then we try it and we're like oh 
that doesn't work. So so there was definitely um, an element of of working in that way. And then that process happened again with the book's um, designer at Picador, who's um, who I then sat down with and we tried to the the way in which the pages, the photographs land on the pages and where they sit in terms of the storytelling on the turn of the page in the book. So Mm. that was another level of 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 process that was undertaken there that that also had something in common with filmmaking but had a level of art in it that was um you know tremendously enjoyable i mean and i couldn't have been more delighted with richard's photographs he has such a sort of keen and compassionate eye i'm 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 you know i'm they are a vital part of the book they work beautifully um before we talk about how medicine the practice of medicine has changed in the 50 or 55 years since Berger wrote his book tell us a bit about how the valley has changed in the 55 years since Berger wrote his book I mean that's that's a really interesting question because at one level it looks remarkably similar so there's a there's a there's a lovely bit of BBC film of the doctor in Berger's book that was um filmed I think in 1967 so, um, and it it shows the doctor sort of getting into his Land Rover outside his little surgery and going driving down this leafy lane the cameraman is obviously sitting next <laughs> in the passenger seat next to the doctor and and they and the the Land Rover rolls up and over a an, an old iron bridge over the river and there's this great um <clears throat> this great bank of dark woodland ahead and if you were to do that drive today, it would look exactly the same. <laughs> wow. I mean, exactly the same. So you can re- just even the sort of angle of the, you know, angle of the rooftops, light on the woods, curve of the river, the way, and I mean, remarkably similar, um, in a way that's very unusual for a landscape to have been so apparently untouched. Touched. That said, you know there are other respects in which the landscape and particularly the community who lives here that lives here has has changed beyond recognition in that time. Um, so what was um, you know all the old workers' cottages that scatter the 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 sides of the valley and are scattered through the woods? Those have become rather kind of desirable homes now. Um, lots of them extended. And <laughs> and improved and um and the community that was once rather insular forest community is now full of commuters and people who work in london and <laughs> you know that, so there's a the community itself is a is a is a sort of hybrid now of the old families who've been here for generations and and lived in this place and as it were, incomers. So there's a, there's a real there's a real tension of continuity and great change held within yeah. this landscape and within the community itself. I was put in mind of that line of T. S. Eliot's when I was reading the book, which was the when the way that the landscape sort of has this unche- slightly unchanging quality, and the people come and go. That the, the, Eliot talks about the point of intersection of the timelessness with time, which I thought was. Mm. <laughs> Um, I mean, indeed. Uh, there's, there's. Uh, so, if I look out of, if I look out of my my office window here, I cannot see any other houses. All I can see is a great billowing ocean of woodland, <laughs> going, uh, going off into the distance. And you know, it it will have looked like this for a thousand years. <laughs> yeah. And and yet the world, yeah. And yet I'm here on Zoom. <laughs> but you know that 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 te- at some level tells you tells you everything you need to know and is it is it fair to say that you're i mean i'm not it's not all about comparing your book with burgess because burgess your book your book yeah. works perfectly brilliantly as a standalone book mm. but is, would it be fair to say that you're much more interested in the way that doctors think and feel than Berger was yes i think i am i think i am i think he um doctors at large certainly my your subject doctor, right? my yeah. subject Certainly. I mean, I think there is something of the inner life that obsesses me and always has obsessed me, the the nature of the inner life. And I think there is something in Berger's approach where um, 
he reflects profoundly on the inner life of the Doctor in his book. He reflects somewhat less on the inner lives of the community, I, I, I feel. Um, so there is something in the way... So you know, he, he writes of the sort of cultural deprivation and by implication paucity of inner life of the people who live in this community. And that has not been my experience at all. I mean, I, I wasn't, I didn't have an axe to grind. So I mm. didn't have a story that I wanted to tell <laughs> in some sense. I was, it was a very pure documentary endeavour at one level. So there was this extraordinary coincidence that started the book, which was finding this book behind my mother's bookcase, feeling very kind of emotionally connected to it because it was set in a place that I live. And it was also co concerned a doctor's work, which is something that had personally preoccupied me greatly. But then I went to the doctor in the book with no sense of what I was going to find. So I didn't go to her thinking, right, I am going to, I am going to mount a campaign for the prioritising of the doctor-patient relationship within medical policy. Not at all. I, I went to her, you know, with a really the most open mind of, I, what will I find when I get there? Talk to me. And... Uh, and tell me about your life and what will we find? Um, and the purity of that process, I think, has 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 sort of borne riches, has really borne riches for me as a writer. Is is that I didn't I I was I wasn't I wasn't setting out to say something. Uh, uh, the process unfolded, and the mm. story evolved in a way that was organic and therefore tremendously compelling yes all and all all the doctor's patients seem to agree that she's a, a good listener and um yeah. you were talking about listening earlier on i was mm. very struck by the way that listening changes um with the arrival of covid later in the book which we mm. could probably have an entirely different podcast about but uh, <laughs> yes but covid has the effect of sort of distancing and muffling everything doesn't it uh, everything it takes place through a mask at distance and the do our doctors on 16 phone appointments every morning i think you say at one mm. point mm. um how did how did the infernal covid um, changed the way that you were writing and researching the book. Is about, I suppose there are obvious ways in which it did, but in other ways. Yeah, so, I mean, at a, at a practical level, I mean, what's interesting is that it was because of COVID that the doctor and I decided that for good, you know, safety reasons, we would do lots of our interviews on foot, walking out in the woods, rather than <laughs> sitting in the surgery. So, so we we at one level, I think it, in a sense, opened up the story. There's there's because we walked through the landscape as we talked about her life serving this landscape. So. Um, I think well, that's sort of a wonderful silver lining to what was otherwise. This <laughs> is an extraordinary silver lining, um, yeah. in an extraordinary silver lining that, um, and and not one I had anticipated. Um, you know, and initially, it, I'd worried about that, but it actually it was a it was a gift. It was truly a gift in terms of the, and I think it facilitated a more, a greater intimacy of discourse between us. The, I wonder the, if that, that immersive that is there quality, on the page. Yes, I wonder if that immersive quality in the book was in fact somewhat a byproduct of COVID in that sense, that, the, that, that there is this intimacy that you can feel as a reader. It's fascinating. Mm. Um, I mean, I think so. And I, I, but, you know, and I also think, I mean, this is <laughs> just bluntly practical, but, the, but I did nothing but that book. <laughs> For the months that I, because it, because it was written during the pandemic, I did nothing else. My head was never, I never left the valley. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, it was a very, it was such an immersive time. I mean, I wrote the book really, really, at one level, really quite fast, but I did nothing else. And so that, 
sort of single dreamlike quality to it, I think in part comes from some of the pragmatic nuts and bolts of how it was written. I mean, there's a whole other story to have about the deleterious effect of the pandemic on an already beleaguered um, state of primary care. But, you know, maybe that's maybe that's for another question. Well, indeed, that may be the next podcast. Um, <laughs> a, couple, a couple of other questions as we're running out, out of time. I mean, it, it felt to me at, at, in, in, in the round that A Fortunate Woman is a, is a sort of study fundamentally of kindness and tenderness. Mm. Um, do you agree? And if you do, do you think these virtues are undervalued today, that, that we as a society are rather good at caring generically, but not necessarily specifically, if, if you know what I mean? I mean, I would agree with you that that is entirely, entirely what the book is about. It's about the process and, and practice of care. And also its complexity. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think there's a, I think there is a, a story told about medicine that places an emphasis on efficiency and, access, you know, I offer you the, you know, raging debate about access within primary care, you know, which is politically uh, certainly an extremely hot topic. Uh, and it is to the but, you know, I think I think general practitioners all over the land and indeed all over the world would agree that simply access to a doctor is not really the heart of what that doctor patient relationship is about it's not what care is about it is about relationships um and so i suppose at some level that the 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 quite how important those relationships are is absolutely threaded through the book at every level it's how the doctor and i work together it's underpinned by at one level, emotionally, by the relationship I had with my mother and where the story came from in the first place. It's about the doctor and her and her relationship with her patients and the trust with her patients. You know, she had something like 130,000 patient encounters during her 20 years in the Valley. That's a lot of time spent with people. You know, that's a, wow. that's a, there's a great depth to that. Mm. But in tiny little increments, but is, there's, a, there's a respect in which... That is about the human to human relationship that I think has somewhat got lost in contemporary medicine and that I think many, many doctors, you know, passionately wish to restore. Yes, you say that, don't you? I mean, you talk about the fact that the emergence of a medicine, medical practice based, grounded more in evidence has had certain benefits. It's standardised care and has improved outcomes in certain regards. But you do say very memorably that something vital has been lost. Can you, can, as, we, as we wrap up, can you, can you talk about that something? What's the something vital that we have lost? Is that there's a, you know, so there's a, a, a partly it's sort of systemic. So there's a move towards, if you like, easy to measure metrics and standardised interventions within evidence-based medicine. Now, it would be a fool. You'd be a fool to, <laughs> to discount evidence-based medicine. It's the foundation of, you know, it, it's seen enormous strides in the treatment of disease. However, by shifting the emphasis towards what is easy to measure, and relationships are not the value of relationships is at one level not easy to measure. Um, that there is a sense of just the way in which those priorities are stacked and the priorities increasingly stacked towards a more transactional rather than relational model of relationship between doctor and patient. But it's catastrophic in its effects. You end up with very dissatisfied patients. You end up with miserable doctors. And you also, you know, it, 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 it's born out on the kind of bottom line of health outcomes because actually relationships really do matter. Um, you know, there's been some extraordinary studies that, that, you know, there was an extraordinary study come out of Norway last year that had said, you know, you see the same doctor for up to 15 years, and, and there is a 25% lower mortality rate. I mean, these are proper numbers. So it's that something that's 
to, you know, seems rather sort of cosy and nice to have, but, you know, come on, life's hard, budgets are limited. Actually, it's of enormous mm. importance. So there is a real, alongside this rather intimate storytelling, there is a much, much bigger story, which I really hope that the book manages to communicate about. You know, it really, these relationships really matter. I, it's just incredibly timely. <laughs> incredibly mm. timely. It's very opposite that you're making these points right now that is sadly um all we've got time for um thank you so much polly for joining us and congratulations again on a fortunate thank woman you. being shortlisted for the bailey gifford prize 2022 um it's been really lovely to talk to you well lovely to talk to you too um thank you for joining us join us uh, next time for another conversation with a shortlisted author for the bailey gifford prize 2022 as always, we're immensely grateful to the Blavatnik Family Foundation for its generous support of this podcast. See you next time. Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation.